There have been a lot of great factions in wrestling who have gotten more than their fair share of praise over the years. Just look at the NWO, the Four Horsemen, or D-Generation X if you want any evidence of this. And perhaps that's had the knock-on effect of leaving others who deserve to be looked back upon more fondly forgotten in the grand scheme of things, as there just isn't enough space within the discourse to include them. So let's try and rectify this today by focusing on some of the most underrated factions in wrestling history. And where better to start than with the group known as the Un-Americans? Why start here? Well, given how much of a career renaissance Christian Cage is currently undergoing in All Elite Wrestling, it's a perfect time to remind ourselves that he was always great, especially back in 2002, as it was then that, with a new, fresh heel character and a chip on his shoulder, he decided to form a stable of heel Canadians alongside Lance Storm and Test. And given their target was America and all its fans, as they felt like being from the north of the border made them better, it's fitting this group would go by the name of the Un-Americans. Yes, by targeting the US specifically, the trio from the Great White North were quickly able to make a splash on both Raw and SmackDown during the summer of this year, when they got into the short feuds with the likes of Rikishi, Hulk Hogan, and The Undertaker. Hell, at one point they'd even decide to go after a Canadian they felt had betrayed their people when they specifically set their sights on Edge. And all this served to raise their profile so much that by July, two of their members, Christian and Storm, went on to not only challenge for, but win the WWE Tag Team titles, with such a move just proving how serious they were about their hostile takeover attempt. Of course, that wasn't even the final form of the Un-Americans, though. No, there was still a fourth member to come, a member who was at one point planned to be Chris Jericho. But once Creative decided to axe this, William Regal was brought on board instead, with the logic being that as an Englishman, he shared the same hatred of Americans as his heel Canadian counterparts did. Sadly though, it would also be around the time that Regal joined that the stable began to fall apart, as on September 23rd of that same year, Christian and Storm lost the tag titles to Kane and the Hurricane. And only a few weeks after this, the team of Test and Regal ate a pinfall too when they went up against Rob Van Dam and Tommy Dreamer. So now on the downswing, the Un-Americans reacted as all slimy villains do. They turned on each other, with this leading to the group splitting apart at the seams as the whole thing soon became no more. It's just as well they weren't the only great faction in WWE around this time then. Yes, uh, just a couple of years later in 2004, right as fans were looking for the next big heel group to jeer over, John Bradshaw Layfield delivered in a big way when he formed the Cabinet. Who were the Cabinet? Well, they were the collective charged with making sure the WWE title stayed around the waist of the Texan, with their ranks including Orlando Jordan, the Basham brothers, Jillian Hall, and Amy Weber. And given this was the point JBL was playing his J.R. Ewing-esque tycoon character, it only made sense he'd arrange the whole thing like a presidential cabinet, complete with titles like co-secretaries of defense for the Bashams and official image consultant for Weber. Would this bring him the success he so desired? Yes, because during the period the stable was around, the champ went on an, at the time, SmackDown record 280-day reign on top. Unfortunately though, the same triumphs would not befall his lackeys, as outside of a brief United States and WWE Tag Team titles run for Jordan and the Bashams respectively, they'd never really get over with fans in a notable way. And maybe that's why the cabinet isn't remembered as fondly as it should be. After all, the best factions usually create a whole host of new stars in their wake. But then this one was never really about creating new stars, no it was all about emboldening JBL. So if it succeeded in doing such a thing, it has to be considered a win. And it's not the only faction from mid-2000s era SmackDown which served the same basic purpose either, because a couple of years after that in 2006, Booker T was turning himself into a bigger star than ever by surrounding himself with King Booker's court. But wait, what was the story here? Well, after winning the King of the Ring in May of that year, Booker started presenting himself as royalty by adopting an English accent and wearing a crown and cape everywhere he went. So obviously then, what every king needs once they've been coronated is a court around them to both advise and do their bidding. And that's what the Houston native quickly got to work on getting sorted out at this point, as he went about hiring William Regal and Fit Finley to stand in his corner going forward. And they wouldn't be the only people knighted by King Booker either. No, his wife Charmel would also serve as his queen, all while Hornswoggle was being brought in as a jester of sorts. 
Yes, every avenue was covered when it came to what the king wanted. And so perhaps it should come as no surprise that once his court was finalized, he immediately began setting his sights on winning some gold. What would he go after? Well, initially it would be the United States title, then held by Bobby Lashley. But once his attempts to defeat the Almighty proved fruitless, Booker decided to change course and go after an even bigger fish when he became the number one contender to Rey Mysterio's World Heavyweight title. And so it was that at the Great American Bash on July 23, 2006, the King challenged the Lucha legend and not only took him to the absolute limit, but beat him for the belt. That's right, finally, Booker T had something around his waist which could match the crown sitting atop his head. And as if that wasn't good enough news, it was also around here that Finley beat Lashley for the US title too, meaning the stable were now dripping in gold. But alas, even if they were on top of the world, nothing could last forever. And this was especially true of King Booker's court, because following a series of incidents where the new world heavyweight champion began berating his underlings for not doing a good enough job, they all slowly started to turn on him, something which led to the demise of the stable entirely come the autumn. Maybe what they needed in order to stay together for longer wasn't a master and servant relationship then. No, maybe it was family. After all, just one year later in 2007, another hugely underrated group found even greater success when they came together as La Familia. Who were La Familia? Well, they were a family of brothers and sisters brought into each other's orbit with one goal and one goal only, take over SmackDown. Sure, they had other objectives too, such as making sure Edge remained the World Heavyweight Champion or going after other gold like the WWE Tag Team titles, but those were all in service of the greater task at hand. And this worked out perfectly for them as it happened. So perfectly that over the course of their run, the Rated R Superstar held the top prize a total of six times. And as if that weren't enough, Chavo Guerrero Jr., another member of the stable, was able to win the ECW World title, all while Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins were able to become tag team champions for a while too. Hell, at one point the whole thing even spilled over into the WrestleMania main event when, at WrestleMania 24, Edge took on The Undertaker and got more than a little help from his crew in the process of doing so. Yes, he would lose that night, as would Chavo, but it wasn't the end of the world because with Vicky Guerrero, the at the time on-screen lover of Edge being the general manager of SmackDown, there was always going to be new opportunities for them going forward. Well, at least there was up until the point the current AEW star decided to cheat on his bow during the lead-up to their wedding, with this being a move which led to her understandably turning on him and pretty much severing the ties which held La Familia together in the process. That's right, even if they did briefly reform again further on down the line, it would never be the same, and so this ultimately served as the moment the Rated R Superstar's hubris got the better of him and cost him a near unbeatable crew of lackeys who were willing to stand in his corner at all times. So with that in mind then, maybe you could argue it's not best to have a great stable built around family either. No, maybe it's better to build it around a cult of personality instead, such as was the case with the Straight Edge Society in 2009. Yes, the Straight Edge Society represents one of the quiet highlights of the Second City Saints' career. Really, you could argue it was the first time he ever really came into his own in WWE, as it was when he was first trusted to carry the responsibility of leading an entire faction. And boy did he knock it out of the park with this one. So much so that we're shocked it isn't remembered more fondly today. Basically, it all began when Chaos Magic Punk took Festus under his wing and effectively retconned his character by having him become someone who'd only been the way he was because he was hooked on prescription drugs. And once he was off these drugs then, he was able to go back to his old personality of Luke Gallows. Yes, in one simple move, Punk had transformed the life of a down and out so much, it started to get him wondering if he wasn't a messiah of sorts, a straight edge messiah. So looking to test this theory and add even more followers to his flock in the process, he quickly got to work on helping others like Serena Deeb, someone who at this point was portrayed as a fan that desperately wanted to be saved from her sins. How would she be saved? Well, by shaving her head and agreeing to abstain from all drugs and alcohol going forward. The same thing Joey Mercury agreed to do when he joined the group as well soon thereafter. Of course, they all had to promise they'd help their leader to get the win during his feuds against the likes of Rey Mysterio and The Big Show too, as let's not forget, this was all ultimately about one person, and one person only, CM Punk. 
Even when the focus should have been on his underling, in fact, the voice of the voiceless always managed to keep it on him. And in the end, it was this which caused the group's downfall, as once he decided they weren't doing enough to keep him on top, the man who since managed to pretty much blackball himself from the entire industry kicked his crew to the curb, ending the straight-edge society in the process as he moved on to the next willing group of fanatics. So maybe being in a cult isn't the best way to create a highly rated faction either then, making us wonder what the hell is. And it's not as if we'll find a better answer if we look to TNA around the same time either, because there, the beautiful people were proving that, even if you were great, it didn't mean you were going to get the credit you deserved. Yes, this one is particularly hard to accept, as you could argue that between 2007 and 2011, there were few things going on in Nashville which were better than the stable made up of Angelina Love, Velvet Sky, and Daddy Ass himself, Cute Kip. Hell, at one point they'd somehow become even greater than they initially had been when they added Madison Rain and Lacey Von Erich to their ranks. What was it that made them so good? Well, they were basically Impact's version of the Mean Girls from... well, from Mean Girls. And so this led to plenty of opportunities for cartoonish segments where they trashed everyone else on the roster for not looking as good as they did. So far would they go with this in fact, they'd regularly force opponents to wear paper bags over their heads so as to hide their faces from the world. And when they weren't doing that, they always had some makeup and hairspray on hand which they used to try and pretty them up a little bit. Needless to say then, this led to them making a lot of enemies amongst the TNA roster over the months and years which followed. Not that they cared about this though. No, they were far too concerned with making sure they were always glammed up for TV instead. But that shouldn't suggest that they were so vain that they didn't prepare for their matches. Quite the opposite in fact, because over the course of their run, they'd hold six TNA Knockouts Championships and two TNA Knockouts Tag Team Championships amongst themselves, proving just how serious of a threat they could be when they set their mind to it. And that same mentality of setting your mind to something then achieving it could also be found in another highly underrated stable which existed three full decades prior to this. Though to talk about them, we're going to have to travel back to World Championship Wrestling, as that's where Paul Heyman's Dangerous Alliance thrived. That's right, before he was the advocate for the likes of Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns, before he was even the owner of ECW, Paul E. Dangerously was making a name for himself as the man behind one of the most dominating heel factions in North America at the time. But then given the ranks included the likes of Arn Anderson, Rick Rude, Bobby Eaton, Larry Zbysko, Medusa, and a young Steve Austin, why would they be anything less? So why isn't the Dangerous Alliance more fondly remembered then? That's hard to say, but it could be because they came from a period of WCW most modern fans may not be as familiar with as it was pre-Monday Night Wars. What it most certainly isn't because of though is a lack of talent and hard work from the people involved, as following their inception in 1987, they'd spend the next five years creating numerous classic moments, such as the time Austin feuded with Ricky Steamboat over the WCW World Television title, or the war games bout they all took part in at Wrestle War 1992. Sadly though, it was also at this point the downfall would begin as after Larry Zbysko was expelled from the group following his unintentional costing of his team the victory, larger cracks began to form. Cracks which led to the whole thing pretty much falling apart come the end of the year. And sure, we know a different version of the group would end up coming about in ECW a few years later, but that never managed to create the same magic as the original had done. Now if you want a faction from this company which was truly underrated, then you just have to look at the triple threat. Of course, part of the reason this one has never gotten its due is because there was never one solid incarnation which lasted for long enough to establish itself as a legendary act. That's right, after the first version of the Triple Threat formed in 1995 with world champion Shane Douglas and tag team champions Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko as their members, things would have to be reworked once the former left to join WWF. So at this point, Too Cold Scorpio was brought in as his replacement then, a move which only solved the problem temporarily, as soon after, Benoit and Malenko would also get poached away, though in their case it would be WCW who signed them to big money contracts instead. But even that didn't mark the end of the triple threat. No, once Douglas returned to ECW in late 1996, he'd try the whole thing again, this time with Chris Candido and Brian Lee as his stablemates. And while this version of the group never found the same levels of success as the first or even the second, it was still worth checking out as it was during their run together that Douglas became television champion. 
That said, once Lee decided he'd had enough of being the champ's lackey, another change in personnel would be required, with it this time being Bam Bam Bigelow who was brought in to replace him. And not long after that, a fourth member would also confusingly be added in the form of Lance Storm, but while this technically made the triple threat a foursome, it only meant that they'd find even more success, with Storm and Candido becoming tag team champions together at one point. So given how quietly successful they were, when they broke up entirely again not long after that, it was always going to be a matter of time until the idea was revived once more, such as was the case in 1998 with the new triple threat, which featured Rob Van Dam, Sabu, and Taz. But not every stable gets to have a second or even third life after their first go-round, and that's what makes the downfall of our next subject so sad, because had they only been remembered for their NXT run, Sanity would likely be considered one of the better factions in recent WWE history. Sadly though, their time on the main roster was so damaging, it's led most to simply write them off today, as there they were treated like absolute jobbers. But it wasn't always this way. No, while they were part of the black and gold brand between 2016 and 2018, the stable made up of Eric Young, Alexander Wolfe, Killian Dane, Nikki Cross, and briefly Sawyer Fulton were absolutely dominating in everything they did. Hell, at one point, Young and Wolfe would even win tag team gold together when they defeated the Authors of Pain for the honor. And while they were doing this, Cross was making life for then NXT Women's Champion Asuka a living hell. Of course, for as much success as they had when they branched off though, the group were ultimately at their strongest when they united as one to go after the other biggest faction in Florida at the time, the Undisputed Era. And it was this feud which eventually led to Triple H deciding to revive war games for the first time in 20 years, as there was simply no other way the beef between the stables could be settled. Sadly though, Sanity ended up coming out of that bout to the losers, and with such a loss signaling the beginning of the end of their time on the developmental roster, it also meant their peak period would be coming to a close too, as once they moved up to SmackDown a few months later, Nikki Cross would be separated from them, and the three remaining men were left to flounder in a series of nothing matches against the likes of The Usos and The New Day. But at least they'll always have that NXT run to hang their hats on, something which can't be said of our next subjects today, because from minute one, they always struggled to get over with fans, despite the fact that they were actually pretty good. Who are we talking about here? Why, the Million Dollar Corporation, of course. Yes, it was back in May of 1994 that, after retiring from in-ring competition due to a series of injuries, Ted DiBiase moved into a more managerial role, and this role would see him gather a number of performers he was high on and bring them together to be a part of his own million dollar stable. Who were such performers? Well, during the early days it would be Nikolai Volkov, The Fake Undertaker, Bam Bam Bigelow, and IRS, but as time went on and the first two disappeared from WWF, New members were recruited in the form of Tatanka, Kama, King Kong Bundy, Psycho Sid, and even briefly, the 123 Kid and the Ringmaster. So with such a huge level of talent under his wing, you'd think DiBiase's Million Dollar Corporation would go on to dominate mid-90s New York then, right? Well, not quite, because while they would get the occasional win, for the most part they'd be booked as cannon fodder for other, bigger stars like The Undertaker, Lex Luger, or Razor Ramon. And sadly, after a while, these losses started to take their toll on the stable members, with them gradually leaving as a result. Hell, come 1996, there were only four people left. Tatanka, the 123 Kid, the Ringmaster, and DiBiase himself. And even this nerfed version of the group wouldn't last for long, because when it became clear Steve Austin was going to be a far bigger star than anyone could have initially imagined, he was split off too, and in the process, Ted DiBiase would leave the company entirely and make the jump over to WCW instead, where he became the fourth member of the NWO. Yes, just like that, the Million Dollar Corporation was no more. But even if it isn't as well remembered today, at very least, it can say it introduced WWF fans to the man who'd go on to become the biggest star the company had ever seen a few years later.